لله حمدا يوافي نعمه ويكافئ مزيده وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا كريم by the grace of Allah Azza wa Jal we come together yet again uh, to speak of this topic and the topic being the uh, hadith of Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم and what we'll be discussing particularly today is the historical aspect of how the hadith of Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم was written down how it was pre- prepared in terms of how it was put together. Today we have at our disposal disposal very easily Sahih al-Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, Sunan Abi Dawood, all the other Sunan, books of a hadith that are innumerable, very many. But for the ulama to get to that stage, and for the ummah at large to get to that stage, where they have these books very nicely printed, Papers very nicely cut and very precisely written. There was a number of stages that the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam had been through. The first of those stages of course was the stage in the time of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasallam himself. The time of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasallam himself. And this was um, kind of difficult at the time of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasallam. As the Prophet ﷺ uh, came in a time where things to write on were very seldomly found. And people that would write were very seldomly found as well. But we understand from the sunnah of our dear Prophet ﷺ and the teachings of the Qur'an itself that the whole concept of reading and writing was being aided almost being aided by Allah Azza wa Jal, so that people can get away from illiteracy and they can get to a level of literacy. And that's why you see the first verse where Allah Azza wa Jal, uh, you know, revealed to mankind for the rest of time until the Day of Judgment was what? Iqra, read. Bismi Rabbika Allahi Khalaq. In the name of your Lord that had created you. A few verses later, Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala says, what does he say? He says, "Alladhi allama bil qalam," the one that had taught through the through the pen. Why? Because Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is trying to show you that through wahi that reading and writing is very crucial, and that is what is going to slowly develop the nation to come. And similarly, Allah's Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, when it came time for the people that were captured in Badr, what did he do? A lot of the people that were captured, the Prophet ﷺ made their ransom that they come, and if they were, they were able to read and write, that they come and they teach 10 from amongst the, children's of the children of the believers how to read and how to write. And through that, they were able to free themselves from the capture at Badr, even. So undoubtedly the Prophet ﷺ, the sunnah of his, uh, and his teachings, <coughs> Allah Azza wa Jal Himself were aiding the concept of writing. So there started, you know, um, the writing of hadith. There started the writing of hadith. The hadith was written during the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ. Not all of the hadith, because the Prophet ﷺ was a walking, talking example. Everything he did was exemplary. Everything he did should have been recorded. So not everything during the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ we were able to have in written recording. However, there was a large portion of the sunnah that was recorded. Now some people will come and they'll say that, do you not see that the Prophet ﷺ, he said, clearly, in the hadith of Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, he said clearly, and the, <coughs> and the hadith in Sahih Muslim, he said clearly, لا تكتب عني شيئاً غير القرآن. Do not write anything that I say except the Qur'an. وَمَنْ كَتَبَ عَنِّي شَيْئًا غَيْرَ الْقُرْآنِ فَلْيَمْحُ And whoever wrote anything that I said uh, besides the Qur'an, then let him wipe it away, erase it. 
So some people will say, oh, the Prophet ﷺ was saying such. So what are we supposed to do? You're telling me that the sunnah was written during the time of the Prophet ﷺ. But the Prophet ﷺ in the clear hadith of Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, which was found in Sahih Muslim, he's saying that do not write anything except the Qur'an. Well, if we look at the rest of السلام, if we look at the rest of the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, we'll find that there were incidents where the Prophet ﷺ also gave permission to people to write. So, <coughs> if you look for example, at the hadith of Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As ta'ala, where he said to Abdullah, he said, basically what happened was, that Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, he used to write a lot of hadith, a lot of hadith. He used to write it down. Abu Huraira used to memorize, whereas Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, he used to write. So, <coughs> people looked at Abdullah ibn Amr al-As, they said that you're writing down everything that the Prophet ﷺ is telling you. You're writing everything down. And the Prophet ﷺ is human. Sometimes he might get angry and say something that is not to be considered a legislation in the deen of Allah Azza wa He might say something that's not to be considered a legislation in the deen of Allah. Sahih? So, Umar, uh, Abdullah ibn Amr, he said, what am I supposed to do? He went to the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam himself, and he said to the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, that, O Prophet of Allah, I came across such a situation. You know, I'm writing everything you're saying. I'm writing everything you're saying. However, what's happening is people are telling me that sometimes you might be angry and such and such might occur. What am I supposed to do? So the Prophet ﷺ looked at Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As, he said, Uktub, tawalladhi nafsi biyadi, la yakhruju min fami illa haq. That write for verily by the one, as in Allah Azza wa Jal, by the one in whose hands is my soul. Nothing comes out of this mouth except the truth. So based on this, you know, Abdullah ibn Amr al-As, he realized that I can write. And I can continue to write. And you have the example in, ha- in Hajjat al-Wada itself, where the Prophet ﷺ was in Mecca. And what happened was, that Khuza'a, they killed a man from Banu Layth. Khuza'a, they killed a man from Banu Layth. Because of a person that Banu Layth had killed from amongst Khuza'a. So they were taking revenge. So then <coughs> the Prophet ﷺ, he stood up and he gave some of the rulings pertinent to Qasas. And when he said that, a man stood up and he said, Uktubuli. A man by the name of Abu Shah, Shah he got up and he said, Uktubuli, write it down for me. So the Prophet ﷺ, he replied, and he said, Uktubuli Abi Shah, write it down for Abu Shah. So there was incidents in the life of the Prophet ﷺ where he commanded people to write things down. From amongst the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ himself. Now, one may ask that in one hadith we're hearing this, and another hadith we're hearing something else. So what are we supposed to do? What are we supposed to do? Or what are we supposed to make of this? Well, the reality is that the Prophet ﷺ in earlier times, he had forbid people from writing down the hadith. That is correct. In earlier days. And later on, this concept of not writing down was abrogated. Was abrogated. It was finished. It came to an end. And then the Prophet ﷺ commanded people to write, but, you know, under certain guidelines. The Qur'an was still given precedence in terms of writing. But the Prophet ﷺ generally, it wasn't a problem if people wrote. And how do we know this? <coughs> we know this from the actions of the Sahaba. I gave you one example of Abu Shah. Another example of Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As. Several examples of the Sahaba, like the example of Suhaifat Ali. Ali had a Suhaifah in which he had ahkam also where there was a hadith as well of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, And uh, the uh, Sahifa 
of Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As. Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As, he himself had a sahifa, a, man, a, 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 a scroll in which he had written a number of the hadith. In which he had written a number of the hadith. And Ibn al Athir says, talking about the sahifa of Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As, which he called a sadiqa, the, the truthful scroll. Uh, Ibn al Athir says that it had almost a thousand hadith. So a very large number of hadith written by Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As in the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ. And similarly, other sahaba that had also written down different hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, such as Jabir ibn Abdullah. He had also written down a scroll full of hadith of Rasulullah ﷺ. All of this alluding to the fact that or establishing the fact <coughs> that, that, that the sunnah had been written down even during the Prophet's time itself. And it hadn't been lost. However, the sunnah of Rasulullah wasallam had yet to be compiled almost at an official level. The compilation of hadith in one single scroll, or one single text, or a very large number of hadith compiled together in one text, this had yet to occur. Some people had a couple of hadith written down here, and other people had a couple of hadith written down over here, and so on and so forth. This occurred after the life of the Prophet ﷺ. The first thought that came to anyone's mind, was Umar ibn al-Khattab Umar ibn al-Khattab, he thought about this. He thought, and he thought, and he thought, and he made istikhara for an entire month, thinking to himself that I should maybe collect all the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam and put them together in one scroll, in one uh, manuscript, in one text, in one compilation, so that people, they don't lose the sunnah of Rasulullah. You had the sahaba traveling to different countries. <coughs> you had people that had less religiosity and integrity accepting Islam. You had the tabi'een also being spread in different places. Medina, which was at one point the center of knowledge where all of the sahaba remained, were slowly also dispersing around the world. So the hadith was slowly becoming more and more difficult to get your hands on. So this put, and also people were dying. People were dying. Wars were happening. The battle of Qadisiya, Yirmuk. Battles were occurring, even during the lifetime of Umar himself. So he's thinking to himself, we have the Qur'an memorized, and people are listening to it, people are hearing it. What are we supposed to do? So what he did is he thought about the issue for one entire month and he made istikhara to Allah Azza wa Jal over and over for one entire month and then he came out with one conclusion where he said, Inni kuntu arat. He said, I had wished an aktub sunan I had wished to write down the sunan of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa that's what I'd wished. And then I remembered a people. ثُمَّ إِنِّي ذَكَرْتُ قَوْمًا I remembered a people. They used to be before you people. And they did the same thing. كَتَبُوا كُتُوبًا فَأَكَبُّوا عَلَيْهَا They wrote down different books. And then they begin to get caught up with these books from the book of Allah Azza wa وَإِنِّي لَا أَلْبِسُ كِتَابَ اللَّهِ بِشَيْءٍ And I will never, I will never mix the book of Allah Azza wa Jal with anything. With anything. Because as of yet the Sahaba were still around, though they were dispersing, though some were dying, but in general, anything that was required was still there. The need was there, but it wasn't as great as it became later on. It wasn't as great as it became later on. 
So Umar ibn Khattab, he looked at the people, like look at the Jews and Christians. What happened to them? They wrote books. They were not the true Bibles, not the true Gospels. And then they started to get caught up with them. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, all of these, who were, they're written by people that didn't really know Prophet Isa People that were all on a doctrine that was away from the monotheistic doctrine that even Isa himself came to fulfill. They were all based on a Pauline doctrine. A doctrine that was invented pretty much by a person by the name of Paul. Probably to destroy Christianity while it is in its early rate, you say, you know, early stages. So Umar ibn Khattab is saying here, I saw that people of other nations, when they had written down other books, they got caught up with these books. And the main book that they were given was lost. So I'm not gonna do that for you. But slowly, but surely, the need became more and more and more. It became more and more and more. So then came another man. After Umar ibn Khattab, from his own progeny, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. And Umar ibn Abdul Aziz basically took the thought of his grandfather and he began to apply it. First of all, he sent a letter. <coughs> to the one who used to work for him. As in, the minister that he had set for, Medina, Munawwal. Abu Bakr ibn Hazm. And he wrote to him, and he told him, that look and search whatever hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam you can find, then write that hadith down. And he particularly told him, to go look for two different narrators and take their hadith. Because they used to be very rigorous in the narration. So he told them that look for Amra bint Abdul Rahman al ansariya Go look for a woman by the name of Amra, Amra bint Abdul Rahman al ansariya And this shows you that Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, being a scholar of the Ummah, telling a man to go to a woman and look for the hadith. So it's not impossible that even a woman can reach a certain level of, you know, dignity in the deen. Respect, fadl, and virtue. In fact, for example, the book Ulum al-Hadith, which all of the ulama of hadith have to go back to. By Ibn al-Salah. It's one of the greatest texts of hadith. And when we talk about the text of hadith, I'll tell you as well. It's one of the greatest texts of hadith ever written by Ibn al-Salah. Until recently, we didn't have a person that had taken out this book for manuscripts properly, except a woman by the name of Bint al-Shatib. Who was a alima, she passed away, she was from Egypt. She was one of the big ulama of hadith in our time. By the name of Bint al-Shatib. And similarly, during the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ was no different. Uh, after the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ was no different, Aisha. And over here you have Amra, bint Abdul Rahman al-Ansariya. So he told her to go to Amra, bint Abdul Rahman al-Ansariya. And he told her then, uh, he told him then, to also go to Al-Qasib ibn Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr. And collect all the hadith from these people. However, this command that he had sent for the people of Medina, wasn't just for the people of Medina. It was also... For the people at large, as Abu Nu'aym, he mentions in Tariq Asbahan, he says, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, كتب إلى أهل الآفاق. He wrote to the people of every direction, every horizon. انظروا إلى حديث رسول الله, look for the hadith of the Prophet alayhi salatu wassalam, the messenger of Allah azza wa jal. Look for that hadith, and Fajma'u, put it all together. Put it all together. So during the time of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz came this concept of compiling the hadith at a governmental level. 
Just as the Qur'an had been done earlier, during the four caliphs time. Where it, came, it was a command from the Khalifa himself to come together and bring the hadith of Rasulullah wasallam into a written compilation. But even then, <coughs> we didn't have anyone of these people that were commanded put together almost in entirety the hadith of Rasulullah wasallam, Except one individual. Except one individual that was commanded by Umar ibn Abdul Aziz or encouraged by Umar ibn Abdul Aziz as he was greater in honor in the people's sight during that time. So he didn't command him, he encouraged him. And if he commanded him, he commanded him. And that was a zuhri Al-Imam Muhammad ibn Muslim ibn Shihab al zuhri And he used to be the most knowledgeable of people during that time. With the sunnah of Rasulullah wasallam, And that's why Imam Muslim mentions there's 90 a hadith that were narrated and if it wasn't for Imam Al-Zuhri single-handedly doing this, then those hadith would have been lost. So there was a number of fadail that this man had. Imam Umar ibn Abdul Aziz himself used to tell people to go to the majlis of Imam Al-Zuhri. So Imam Al-Zuhri, what did he do? He, he took the hadith and he took the fatawa, and he took the fatawa of the different tabi'een, he took the athar of the sahaba, and he started putting them together. Compiling them. Without looking at which one is sahih, which one is da'if, which one is not. Without looking at is this really a hadith of Rasulullah, or is it an athar of a tabi'een. So he would put the athar of the tabi'een, he would take the uh, athar of the sahaba, he would take the fatawa, the, jurisdi- the rulings that were given, uh, the jurisprudent rulings that were given by the sahaba, he would take them as well, tabi'een as well, and he would put them all together in one compilation, one work. Why? Because during that time, anyone and everyone that would have been reading this already knew what's sahih and what's da'if. The chains were very short, that's one thing. Secondly, almost anyone that was reading was a alim. And the ilm of hadith was so widespread that even if you come across this book, it's very simple for you to figure out which hadith is sahih and which hadith is da'if. As a alim, because most of the people that were seeking knowledge at that time, uh, uh, most of the people that would have been you know, looking at this work would have been ulama. So it wasn't necessarily written particularly for the sector of society, um, every sector of society. It was written for one sector of society, and that were the ulama, that could easily figure out which hadith is sahih, which hadith is da'if, and so on and so forth. And then the need came further. The need came to now find a book, a compilation that is accessible to every audience. That is easy for you and I, lay people, to read as well. And inshallah ta'ala, about this need we'll discuss in the next class. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.